I will give her vineyards there, and the valley of suffering for a door of hope, and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. Rhonda Lazert Ministries welcomes you to the Door of Hope. Welcome to Door of Hope. It's a pleasure to be with you. Last week, we looked at the subject of the anointing. We'd spent some time in maturing faith and the actual understanding uh, the presence of God somewhat. Um, and then we come to the problem of the anointing of God in our lives and just how relevant is it or is it more duty and doing your best and trying to keep the law to the best of your ability. Uh, but we look back on the scriptures of David uh, with Samuel and the anointing where he came and took him from tending the sheep and anointed him uh, in front of his brothers. We think of Moses who consecrated the priesthood. We go back to Jacob in the very place that he wrestled with God. He poured oil and anointed it. So it's a, it's a theme of the Hebrew scriptures and it's even much more of a theme of the New Testament. The anointing of God, the very spirit and presence of God in our lives. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And you know, it, the, the Bible's complicated. It's historical, it's prophetic. It gives us practical advice, things like the life of the flesh is in the blood. I mean, now we have blood work, but it was written in Holy Scripture some 4,000 years ago. So there's all different aspects of the Holy Scripture. And when we move into the New Testament, we are confronted with the subject of the anointing of God for the believer. And it's according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. And uh, it's, it's a major theme. as. David was anointed the priesthood of all believers, which was one of Martin Luther's main objections to the structure that was present uh, in his time and is still present today, that we are in Christ, the believers, the priesthood of all believers. And we all have a responsibility. I heard it preached by Derek Prince in Jerusalem. You can't get lost in the shuffle. We now have since uh, the veil in the temple was torn from the top to the bottom and the command of Jesus to come boldly before the throne room of grace to find help in time of need. We have this new and living way that is open to all believers and nobody can do the work for us. Uh, yes, we fit into the body of Christ, but it's a one-to-one, -one, not getting lost in the shuffle. And I thought how uh, instead of the pyramid structure that we're so used to and think, you know, uh, that way in such a great way, yet when our journey is over and we meet him uh, and we are before the throne room of grace to enter in, uh, we're judged individually. We're judged on a one-to-one, -one, uh, the sheep or the goats and the rewards for our labors here on earth. So we don't want to lose that uh, great truth that it is one-to-one, -one, that it is Christ in us individually, the hope of glory. And we're all called to be fruit bearers. We're all called to be uh, make life count spiritually. We're all count, called to follow him, to leave everything and follow Christ. That's just the way it's written. And uh, as you read through the New Testament, uh, you see that the Great Commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel is a commission given to us, the church, to believers, that we would speak that which we have seen and heard. I was reading a little bit of Eusebius and wondering what's changed so much uh, from uh, our passion of present day where we want to fit in too much somehow or the early church. And uh, I have come to the conclusion one of the major, major things uh, from the early church to the present day uh, it wasn't just materialism because we have so much distraction now, uh, but that they were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. They saw the living truth, the living proof of the resurrected Lord that appeared for 40 days. And then they went forth not caring, not valuing their lives the way we value our lives today, not trying to squeeze as much pleasure out of our earthly existence as we try and do, all of us. 
but they were eyewitnesses to the resurrection, the great truth of the risen Savior who was seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And we find in Romans, the powerful book, it says, in this way, my friends, you have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. And we get that, most of us, to him who has been raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. While we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are discharged from the law, dead to that which held us captive, so that we are slaves not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. And then Paul goes on to say, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the Spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For this reason that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So we have this call of, this, of God in Holy Scriptures defining the difference of flesh and spirit. Paul said, I pray that your spirit, your soul, and your body be preserved blameless. So the walk in the spirit, the walk according to God's laws, yes, they are uh, an attempt to live a holy life, but they're much more. They're the life and, and focus of God the Spirit in our lives, directing our lives in a very, very clear way. And uh, I, I say it often that I have simplified my face somehow in this journey of the Spirit because I realize that it is lifting my hands unto God with praise and thanksgiving, because he is sovereign, he is Lord, he is Christ. I'm not the major player. He is in charge of all things. He is the creator of all things, but learning to lift my hands unto God and listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit that directs my life. But what's distracting about that? Why doesn't it happen for more and more believers? The Bible warns us in the Gospels that the cares of the world distract us, the deceitfulness of sin, just our, uh, the culture of our age is not a culture that is seeking uh, God or seeking how we can please God, but we're seeking that we can have more and more and more. And, it, you know, you hear the older generation uh, talk about this theme, um, that they've noticed the shift. It is, you know, we, you know, that famous political quote, no, don't ask what my country can do for me, but what I can do for my country. And it is this uh, giving up of self and the desires of the flesh, which uh, lead us to death anyway. The scripture warns us, so to the flesh you'll reap corruption, to the so to the spirit, and you will reap life and life eternal. And uh, why did I somehow find this journey myself? It was just because of the trials I had. And uh, you know, you of Jesus, he descended before he ascended. And some of what I know is that I was just forced into that uh, for uh, just merely to survive, to have wholeness in my being uh, because I had nowhere to go, nowhere to turn, uh, no help except as I put my hand in the master's hand, I saw that he was there most surely organizing my circumstances, directing my path and opening a way that I might survive. So I began to uh, feel that life was somewhat like a high jump bar. I was jumping over, crossing the obstacles of my life uh, by faith and by his spirit, uh, which we uh, recognize in scriptural terms as the anointing, the anointing of God, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, these obstacles shall be overcome. So it is God's Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, the anointing of his Holy Spirit, uh, given to us, given to the church, given for gr his grace so that we might be overcomers and be able to overcome all that is presented uh, to us, the challenges of life, and for most of us, there are many. 
So rather than pouting and um, saying, woe is me, or God doesn't love me, or, or being frozen in our circumstances of, of tragedy, uh, learning to turn the page, and I have found that the only thing that has allowed me to move ahead, move on, to turn the page from difficulties or trials is the very presence, the very spirit, the very anointing of the living God. And it's like, you know, I, I remember uh, feeling uh, like my hands were being pried loose from gripping so tightly uh, to the things that weren't working, being bound down, being uh, tied to my circumstances. And yet the very spirit of the living God, it felt like he was releasing me, removing my hands, my grip upon the things that didn't work. And for me, my greatest challenge was fear. I was a fearful soul. And uh, yet, uh, I've shared this, the, I was, uh, felt led to move into a prayer time of asking for more of God's anointing, more of his presence in my life. It was about 10 years ago. And uh, I, re but I w at the same time I was praying for this, I was always conscious that I, I was dealing with fear in my heart. Just it uh, started as a young kid and my circumstances uh, didn't help, but it wasn't, wasn't, it was more than my circumstances. It was really a spirit of fear upon my heart. But I was calling for more of his anointing, more of his presence in my life. Because, you know, that song of things I've had my fill, but I hunger still for more of you. As we begin to grow in grace and walk with God and uh, think different and experience his presence and uh, just that wholeness comes from him, we're, we're drawn to receive more. More of you, more of you, more of you. So I was battling this and yet praying for more of his Holy Spirit. And I hadn't really connected the two things. Uh, but as I had spent a week in prayer for, Lord, more of your presence, more of you. Help me, forgive me, lead me and direct me. Life of the Spirit. Paul's, you know, you look at his journey and he's shipwrecked twice, I believe. Uh, he's, you know, thrown out of town, beaten, rocks thrown on him. How horrible is that? I mean, this was a man of stature, a Pharisee of Pharisees. He understood his religion, his Hebrew scriptures. He understood that Christ fit as their Messiah. As Isaiah said, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Hallelujah. He saw the, the light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. It was just, and yet he's stoned and he's all of these things. And yet he goes on, always triumphant. Uh, never, you know, he said he was perplexed, despaired, almost without whatever, but he always rose up. He always conquered, he always overcame, and he was just a man. And for me, uh, calling for more of that spirit, that more of that dunamis energy of God, and then lying down one day and actually uh, having the experience of feeling something pulled from my heart. Remember how fear gripped my heart? I could, uh, you know, I was well aware of how, what that emotion felt like. I would lie down and if I had a need or a trouble or something, it was the first thing that came to my mind and I'd have to work through it. Uh, but that fear that gripped the heart as I prayed for more of him and lifted my hands, I could feel an actual presence move something in my being and pull it out and free me from that fear. I, fear is normal, but I, I had more than a normal amount. I had a lot of fear in my heart. And the spirit of life in Christ Jesus set me free. And I've had so many of those encounters that have just uh, surely convinced me that the much more surely of the Apostle Paul in especially in the book of Romans is has called me out is calling us out from living on too low a level that earthly level which is the wages of sin is death and we'd say well I get that but you know uh, I'm not you and um, something's holding me back and why am I not progressing? Because I'd sure like it. I'd sure like to be more of an overcomer. I'd sure like um, 
to be spiritually minded, but it doesn't work for me. But we have the Holy Scriptures that always guide our thoughts. And we, especially in Matthew and Mark, um, we find uh, an explanation for what is holding us back from really receiving the anointing of God. And it's in Mark 4. The sower sows the word, and these are the ones on the path where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground where they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root and endure only for a while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. And these are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the lures of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, and a hundredfold. Well, how clear is that? You hear the word, it touches your heart, you accept it, and you change the direction of your life. The early church witnesses to the resurrection had very little distraction except for survival, and they knew they wouldn't survive. They were slaughtered by the thousands. Uh, so there's nothing to distract them. There was nothing to turn back. They, they believed in the resurrection. Uh, it was part of the Pharisees' basic doctrine, the resurrection of the dead. It's why they uh, honored the body at death and put it in tombs, and because they believed in the resurrection. And uh, no distraction. So we have so much in this life now that distracts us the deceitfulness of sin, the cares of the world wanting more and more and more, and we have only to blame but ourselves if we do not go forward and begin to grow spiritually and mature spiritually. It's not necessarily about doing great acts uh, for him, but it is being that living testimony where we are whole and the anointing uh, is within us and abides upon us so that we might uh, be his vessel and we might be his instrument for his glory. And nothing better than to have prayed successfully for someone where his presence comes in upon our lives and we are able to love the Lord God with our whole heart and our neighbor as ourselves. How good is that? How freeing is that by the grace and mercy of God? But we have to make the decision uh, to move forward in the spirit. And, you know, I get often asked, well, what's the first step? Uh, you know, in Gethsemane, when Jesus, the final hour in his prayer, not my will, but your will be done, we encounter the disciples. And uh, we see that Jesus' word to them, he just says, could you not have prayed one hour with me? Uh, so God doesn't expect us to be on our knees uh, 24 hours a day and you know, climbing impossible mountains all the time. No, I, I just recommend a solid Bible reading. I read a chapter a day myself, and I have a time of prayer uh, where I commit and submit to him. And again, I, I try to have spiritual eyes so I see that God's presence is there. Uh, sometimes when there's, you know, a fork in the road, I realize that I have to seek his guidance and feel that unction and that anointing that I actually take the right turn. I know that the, as you read scriptures, there's warnings of uh, what the wrong turn looks like, each of us having your senses exercised through use. We go back to Matthew and we see his warning and he says, as for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in case a hundredfold, in another 60 and in another 30. I think of the Wesley mother, she married to a physician, had lots and lots of children um, in that time. And she was the mother of John Wesley and Charles Wesley. Charles 
uh, wrote so many glorious hymns that have never been replaced. And John, and uh, the testimony of, of her is that she would throw her apron over herself uh, sometime during the day, I think it was midday, uh, she would throw her apron over herself and the kids knew they couldn't bother her because she was in prayer, she was in communion with, the God, with God, she was taking that time out to make a connection with God by the Holy Spirit uh, so that she had that intact. And it was interesting when they were used by the Spirit of the living God to bring into the forefront, by grace are you saved through faith, it is not of works, but rather a gift of God to all that believe. When she heard this uh, moving from um, a more staid uh, church service style, because remember those two brothers were locked out and they were preaching on the tombstones because they were leaving some of the liturgical part of the service and bringing the main focus of salvation uh, to the congregations, uh, she hustled over there and made them explain why they were preaching and doing what they were doing. In other words, she had a handle on it, and after they gave their explanation to her why they were preaching this gospel in this way, in a less orthodox way than was used to, she went home happy that they had uh, gripped the spirit, they had gripped the a true message of the gospel and the anointing was there for her. And you know, what a woman, what a model for these uh, uh, young men to have a mother who understood scripture, who was concerned about it, was an example of, I'm sure, piety and prayer for her household. So God has called us in interesting ways by his anointing to be his light. And it's a mistake to sell out for anything less. Yes, it's true, we don't have the resurrection, we're not eyewitnesses, but I thank the Lord that I have the uh, Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament that guide my life because what I read here, I find nowhere else. And the sureness and the clearness and the uh, uh, glory of, for me, the New Testament, the much more surely of divine holy scripture that guides my life, that tells me to cast my cares upon him because he cares for me, that tells me to believe in him, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that tells me he took my transgressions, my sin, my iniquity, and covered it because of his precious blood, that tells me by his stripes I am made whole. I would have been dead at 36, and trust me, there's been quite a few years uh, since that divine healing, which uh, still sometimes makes me shudder in my boots. How close a call was that? But yet, all I have learned is with hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise, with a heart of thanksgiving, I will worship you, O Lord. And we can all do that. It says, come, learn of me, buy of me. It doesn't require money. It doesn't require anything with hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise. Whether we need to throw an apron over ourselves or hide away or whatever works for us, but to be a worshiper of God, to have a prayer life, to read his holy word and then follow through with the actions of his Holy Spirit because of the anointing of God that is within us, my spirit I put within you is heaven on earth, his living presence in our lives by his grace and mercy. And we always start by knowing that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that if you believe in him, you will have everlasting life and you will have access to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit given and that Holy Spirit is the dunamis, the power of God in your lives, and you can't get it uh, by just going to church. You can't get it by someone else uh, telling you where to stand or what to think or what to do, as good as that is many, many times, but you have to get it on a one-to-one, -one, come boldly before the throne room of grace to receive help in time of need. So as we bow before God, we bow individually, not getting lost in the shuffle, one to one, the new and living way, come boldly before the throne room of grace to find help in time of need. Oh Lord, we discern, we feel 
were bored anyway with this wood, hay, and stubble of things. I've had my fill, but I hunger still for more of you. And we lift our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our whole being unto you, Lord, with praise and thanksgiving. And we ask you to lead and direct. Speak to every heart, Lord, how we can have more of you, more anointing in our lives, that the cares of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of your wonderful grace. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We win, Lord. We win when we touch your garment and we are made whole and we give you praise, honor and glory and thanksgiving. Hallelujah. Amen. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of glory died my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride oh, Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me I sacrifice them to his blood. See from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flow me. Did have such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns compose so rich a cry?